everyone uh, for joining us this afternoon. My name is Awino Cage, and I'm the chair for the Center for Gender Studies here at SOAS, at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, this event, which is uh, titled COVID-19, an opportunity for structural transformation with a focus on Africa, is being hosted in partnership with the Center for African Studies here at SOAS. I am very, very pleased to have uh, with us a panel of uh, friends, uh, colleagues, um, and uh, comrades, if you will, that I have worked with previously and people who I currently work with at, at the university where I teach who are going to be having this conversation uh, collectively with us. Uh, I will begin by introducing them and then uh, talk to you about the structure of the conversation that we will have. Um, we have with us um, Brian Kagoro, who is uh, talking to us right now from Johannesburg, who is the Programs Director of the African Regional Office of the Open Societies Foundation. We also have with us Godwin Murunga, who's talking to us now from Nairobi, Kenya, who is the Secretary's, Executive Secretary of the Council for Social Science Research, which is also known as CODESTRIA, based in Dakar, Senegal. The, uh, Codestria is headquartered in Dakar, Senegal. We have with us Eva Joy Swin, who is the Programs and Global Engagement Director for Action Aid International. We have Lucia Kula, who is a doctoral researcher with the School of Law at the SOAS, and Seraphine Camden, who teaches at the Africa section of the Department of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a conversation of COVID-19 in Africa with the key question, does this present a uh, an opportunity for structural transformation in Africa? We have framed this uh, panel though around a central question and the central question that we are focusing on uh, emphasizes the role of leadership, the nature of governance and social capital in coalescing citizens around the response mechanisms to COVID-19 in Africa. Because this is a virtual event that we are live streaming at the moment and also recording, I would like to ask that if you're not a member of the panel, please mute your video as well as your microphone. Later on in the conversation, we will have an opportunity for you to engage directly with the panelists. So if you have any questions, please make a note of those and we shall turn to them uh, 45 or 50 minutes into the conversation. Now, to start us off, uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to reflect a little bit on the, on the first question, which is really around what are the ongoing responses telling us about the current situation or the current condition of our continent? And I want to begin with you, Brian, if you could offer, offer us a continental overview. What are you observing uh, when you um, assess, analyze the ways in which different Afri African governments have responded to the challenge of COVID-19 in Africa? Uh, thank you, Awino. Um, when you look across the continent, uh, there have been five strands of response. Uh, the first and most instinctive is the cut and paste response, that uh, what governments have tended to do is just copy and paste what they saw happen in Wuhan, in Italy, uh, in the US, UK and the US. Uh, the second and related to, to, to that first has been the uh, militarized biomedical response. So most of our governments treating this as a war, deploying the military uh, to enforce regulations that have been made. And of course, the point will be made later on on how these regulations sometimes uh, are totally divorced from the context. Uh, so if you have informal settlements, you're washing, asking people, wash your hands regularly, uh, sanitize, uh, socially distance, in, in, in spaces that this is not possible. The third response has been a, 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 um, an attempt to blend science and politics, but with politics still dominating. So if you look at uh, the responses in Rwanda, uh, the responses in South Africa, uh, some of the responses in Uganda, uh, you saw similar responses in Egypt uh, and elsewhere that you have technical experts who are giving advice on the, science, on the science, but the political class is still determining what happens. And the last response is the Gufuli uh, type response where it's all politics uh, or mostly politics and very little deference to science. So the political imperatives um, 
Uh, and in between, of course, is a spectra of responses where the dominant economic interests have driven uh, both uh, choices with respect to when do you lock down a country, when do you ban uh, travel, when do you limit particular type of activities, and when do you reopen? Because we're seeing relaxations in Rwanda, uh, in Ghana, and elsewhere. These are driven largely by economic interests. What has not happened across the continent? We have not seen any response that's driven by the request, the demand, and the interests of ordinary people. We have not seen in the design any such requests. There's been three outstanding features of this continental response, and let me end with that. The first one is that if you look at the frontline health workers that we're always ta talking about, uh, in any of our countries, we're talking about nurses, we're talking about orderlies, we're talking about almost 87% of these are women. If you look at the community caregivers, mostly women. Now what's happened is in the national task forces, very few have a critical mass of women and very few of the national responses have uh, consulted women. Uh, although in the West, most of the people dying are elderly, uh, what the pandemic has done on the continent is literally uh, also affected young people in a very significant way. Uh, there's not been any significant involvement of young people in any of these responses. And, and the third is the informal sector and the rural sector. So you get the sense that uh, our governments have no reliable data or statistics on the informal sector and on the rural sector. So all the responses, be they economic, or biomedical or military have tended to focus on what is so-called formal sector. So that means the invisibilization of the majority of the people in the response and their absence in the design, in the implementation, except as recipients of state terror and sometimes the most ridiculous prescriptive uh, uh, prescriptions by government means that we are going to have problems in enforcing this should we have to go more than two months. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Lucia, what, what, what are your observations of Angola? I think I have to agree with Ryan. Um, a lot of the um, implementations and policy trying to contain um, COVID-19 in Angola specifically has been looking at how to ascertain the spread within the capital. A lot of the criticism that the uh, Angolan uh, government has received is how has this approach been how has this approach uh, needed to be widespread to the more rural areas outside of the capital of Luanda, but also looking at restriction of movement of people, specifically those in the informal sector, and not implementing any kind of uh, relief when it comes to econo the economic sense. So as we mentioned, most of the front workers that we have in the continent are predominantly women, but in Angola, the implementation of these workers as key workers um, uh, in the battle against COVID-19 means they also they're not allowed to live with their family this is a government uh, implemented mandate so those who are working in hospitals are not allowed to to live in the same household but this means that they're le they're leaving a lot of families disproportionately affected not only by the, the the threat of the disease spreading but also the economic side of it so how are we able to not only cope with trying to maintain the spread, but also coping with the financial aspect that COVID-19 has introduced in the continent. We don't have the same um, um, implementations of uh, economic relief as we're seeing in the West or even in Asian countries. So how are we making sure that this doesn't have a longer standing effect within the already very porous um, uh, African economic system that we have, specifically in Angola, an uh, ec economy that is very reliant on oil, which has been massively affected. And the, the implementation of trying to get funding to support um, COVID-19 relief has only meant that one, um, loans for countries such as Angola has been very difficult to get. They have been degraded in the, um, in the um in the uh sorry in the economic um in the economic scale so that means that it's very important for us as not only when we're looking at as research just looking at how africa is dealing how african countries are dealing with covid 19 as a relief effort but also looking how we're looking at the majority of reg regular everyday people 
and how it affects them, which is what a lot of the governments are forgetting. We're looking at copy pasting policies and implementations that not necessarily will work within the context of countries such as uh, Angola or even South Africa. Thank you. Uh, EJ, when this, uh, when COVID-19, you know, sort of escalated in the UK, I spoke to a student of mine from Rwanda and I asked how her family was and her immediate response was, you know, we are fine. We trust the government. We know this is a government that is very good at dealing with crisis. People are not worried in Rwanda. Would you argue this is the case in Zimbabwe? How fortunate it is for the Rwandis. Um, yes, thanks very much. And uh, largely agreeing with Brian and, and, and Lucia's points, but I will answer your question first. Um, you know, that, that's the biggest challenge that we have in Zim. Um, you know, people do not trust the ruling party, government, which is the same thing. Um, people do not trust the statistics that are being put out. Um, and one often hears, you know, in the corridors, people say for every, they say there are four people, you should always multiply that by 10. Um, and this doesn't come out of a vacuum. Uh, this is a government that has been known to hide information. Um, uh, the population is largely dependent on one public broadcaster, which is ZBC, which is state owned, um, and therefore information is tightly controlled. Um, you know, the one big newspapers, again, you know, uh, largely state controlled, whether it's the Herald, the Chronicle, Manica Post, um, a few independent ones. Um, so largely people will then depend, I would say, on social media, which is where the conversation is happening. Uh, but within that already you see, you know, uh, that the large majority of the population is excluded. Um, if you take into account that, you know, most people do not have access to uh, the internet uh, and of course to social media, but also, you know, as we speak literally yesterday, uh, one of our biggest um, uh, service providers has just tripled the cost of, uh, of data, um, literally, you know, overnight. Um, but I also want to, you know, paint a picture of, you know, what was the, in medical terms, they would say the, the pre-existing conditions, right, on which um, COVID comes into play in, in, in the case of Zimbabwe, right? Um, so one is going back to the issue of, um, of, of, of trust in the state. I would say the state wasted a lot of time in the early days because this was a slow onset crisis, you know, as we would say in humanitarian circles. We saw it coming. We had two whole months to prepare. Um, I think a lot of time was wasted while people were busy watching airplanes and seeing, you know, where was the travel coming from and, you know, who were the likely vectors, were the Chinese coming in or the Europeans coming in. Um, so in terms of messaging, I think government is now on the back foot trying to manage you know the the, the 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 information that's out there or rather the misinformation where people believe that this is something coming in from the outside so there's a lot of focus on you know who's coming in how do we manage them rather than looking at communities as brian was saying looking at how are people living you know what are the living conditions that will um in the end have an impact on on the rate of spread um you know when you look at that uh, i think secondly one of the big, you know, pre-existing conditions is that we must not forget um, that we still have a large percentage of people in Zimbabwe still living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, the adult pre uh, prevalence rate in Zimbabwe is 12.5%. Um, so, you know, again, in this context, um, you know, you have a particular problem and I want to link that with the existing state of, um, you know, public health. Um, our public health sector was literally on its knees thanks to many years of lack of investment, but also, um, you know, the role of um, the IFIs and uh, the, structure, the impact of structural adjustment programs, which Zimbabwe went through in the 1990s, and those are still with us, um, you know, regardless of the fact that Zimbabwe is not exactly getting, um, you know, any, uh, any support from the IFIs in this moment. So HIV AIDS is still with us. Um, I think the other issue that's uh, with us, again, on which uh, COVID comes is um, uh, the food crisis. You know, Zimbabwe, like most of Southern Africa, is uh, heavily impacted by climate change. Uh, we already saw the impact of that with Cyclone Idai most recently, um, but over many years of uh, drought, uh, failing, you know, rain-fed agriculture. Um, and right now in Zimbabwe, almost 7 million people are in need of food aid. Uh, 
right? Um, and then you have the lockdowns, you know, as, as what Brian was describing, um, where literally overnight government then says, you know, everything is shut down, including the informal sector, and yet those are the, uh, you know, channels for people to get, you know, access to even basic food. And then you had the heavy-handed response from the police, uh, stopping women from going to markets, uh, you know, people buying and selling on the streets, um, you know, the police then seizing uh, the goods from, uh, you know, women in the informal sector, or largely women, and burning them. And then, um, then they had to reverse that, uh, you know, a few days later when it was very clear that, you know, people were going to uh, starve in urban areas. And then I think, you know, the other uh, issue to mention is, of course, in terms of uh, public education, which was also again on its knees. Um, so in a context in which schools have been closed, the children are at home, parents are expected to, uh, you know, provide uh, so-called homeschooling or using the internet, um, it is going to be extremely difficult. It's already extremely difficult. And let me say, it is increasing the unpaid care burdens on women um, at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, EJ. Let me turn to you now, Seraphine, on, uh, on Cameroon. Yeah, thank you, Awino. I would just start by saying um, the situation of Cameroon is far worse than many people think of it. I, I just give you the numbers. Cameroon is among, I think, right now, the three countries in sub-Saharan Africa with the highest numbers. Because we've already hit, we've gone, you know, above 2,000 cases. Now, Cameroon has only 25 million inhabitants. So you see, we are not among the top 10, even in sub-Saharan Africa. But we are having close to the numbers of Nigeria, which is five times bigger than Cameroon. And South Africa is, of course, leading ahead, not in a great sense, because it's not like winning something at the Olympics. So if I go back to your question, what does this tell us about the situation or the current state of the continent? I would like to point out two key things that in the specific case of Cameroon is emerging very strongly. There is what I call a disconnect. So the COVID-19 crisis has shown us very strongly a very, very big disconnect between the political institution and the realities where COVID-19 is hitting most. Now, there will be time, not now, to look at what the evidence or what the operating mode of this disconnect in terms of how the political discourses are not reaching the grassroots. Why is it happening like that? Do, do political institutions have the agency that allows them to have this sort of interventionist approach that they are trying to take? That is, do they have the means for what they want to achieve? So that disconnect is now very, very clear in the case of Cameroon because the government has been totally incapable of tackling this crisis because they are not reaching the grassroots. And again, for many reasons, there are the structural issues. There's even the issue of the ideology of power, which is, for example, centralized in terms of decision-making and funding any programs in terms of tackling the COVID-19. The second thing in the case of Cameroon, which this COVID-19 crisis is teaching us is there is what I call an ineffective over-politicization of an essentially medical issue. With the consequence that in the case of Cameroon, you have a lot of discourses on political aspects when actually the problems are medical in their roots. It's about being in hospital, equipping the hospital, dealing with people, tracing them, and knowing who is sick and following up so that you can control the pandemic. But when you go in the newspapers, even the state television and the public media, it's about political decisions. There's this sort of what I would call almost colonial perception of what power is, which is just like an entitlement so that you will control the discourse on an issue without having enough you know, awareness of what I call the basic impact in the community. In other words, it's far more important that it is the Minister of Health 
who is telling people what's happening with COVID-19 than the hospital giving the information when actually the reality is what's happening in the hospital. The minister has no way, and again, that's the issue of the disconnect that I just mentioned at the beginning, the ministry has not set up a system to even collect the data on COVID-19 because they didn't plan for that. There is no way that in some rural area without electricity, they will know what's going on there. So the fact that the ministry becomes the main point to validate the information about COVID-19 is problematic. I mean, in terms of what we call the factual truth. So these two issues are the one that for the case of Cameroon, I think it's having an impact on how to tackle the COVID-19. That there is this sort of literally, you know, hugging the, the, the podium of COVID-19 where the politicians, the political institution, the government is the only people who are even, even as this morning, deciding that if a private a charity is trying to help the community, then they must go and get an authorization from the administrative authorities, not even the medical authorities, and that it, they must have some evidence that they have been given this authorization to help communities. So people are dying, you want to bring them some help, which is what this is all about, but oh, no, no, don't help them. They may die because you need to go back to the local administrative authority and get an authorization. I mean, this is surreal, but this is the reality of Cameroon as early as this morning. Thank you, thank you, Seraphine. Godwin, I'm hoping you can pick up on something here that Seraphine has said as you talk to us about Senegal or Kenya, whichever one that you choose to focus on. I get the point about politicizing a response to the issue, but can we really argue that this is not a political issue, right? I can see it's it is a health question that raises, in my view, political concerns. And, and politics here is politics writ large. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think there's a risk here much, you could trace also the responses to HIV AIDS in the early years of dealing with a, an issue only as a health concern and then realizing that there are other social and economic repercussions. But develop on this a little, Godwin. No, thank you very much. Uh, actually, as uh, Serafin was talking, I, I thought that uh, the bigger point is not whether it's uh, a politicization of an essentially medical question, or on the other hand, uh, a medicalization of an essentially social political problem. That there is an interplay uh, between those two things, and I think finding the balance. Uh, is what everybody is struggling to do. And unfortunately, in, in, in most cases, uh, we've only begun to confront the, the truth of the matter that uh, medical problems don't happen in heaven. They actually happen in a sociopolitical environment. Uh, it raises very interesting uh, economic questions. And if you're not prepared to handle those things uh, and balance the different uh, dimensions to it, then you end up uh, worsening a situation that would have been uh, better uh, dealt with. And so one of the disappointing things I, I see is that um, we've mobilized doctors, uh, we've mobilized health officers, uh, but I'm not sure we've thought through about the social context within which this disease is happening, this epidemic is, uh, this pandemic is happening. And perhaps in this particular case, more so because uh, we're not here for the short term. Uh, I, I don't see any signs that uh, we're going to be dealing with this uh, in the short term. Uh, I think we are there in the long term. And uh, I was listening to, uh, I think it's the Minister of Health uh, for Singapore who came up with a tripod and says that uh, there are three things that are critical to dealing with the, with, with the, with the pandemic. One of which is uh, the, the, the standard of healthcare. Uh, what do you have in your healthcare system that can deal with this? The second one is the quality of governance, uh, which is perhaps what uh, tends to get a, a shorthand if you approach it strictly as a medical problem. But the third thing he pointed out was um, social capital, the capacity to get uh, the communities to buy into the methods that you use in order not just to control the pandemic, but also to deal with the consequences of how we have dealt with this pandemic. Uh, in most of Africa, uh, I would say in Kenya, for instance, uh, we've been playing catch up, uh, perhaps for understandable reason that we didn't really know how to deal with this thing. Uh, 
Uh, so it's been a, a catch up from the airports, especially the international airports following the, the, the pandemic into to places. And I think it's only this week uh, that uh, we've really begun uh, to do even the basic testing that we need to do uh, in order to deal uh, with this pandemic. And the consequence of that, uh, going back to the point that Brian made, the consequence of that is the cut and paste method is not going to work at all. Because how do you seek to flatten a, a, a curve where you do not have the requisite data to know whether in fact uh, how the curve looks like in the first instance? And so in Kenya, it's, it's raising those kinds of questions um, uh, that I would think uh, uh, come up when you, you have a, a, a system of healthcare that tends to treat pandemics as clinical problems rather than as social problems uh, that need the mobilization of healthcare workers, but also the mobilization of other sectors of society for you to be able. So to, 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 to go back and look at uh, um, uh, the situation in Senegal, uh, if you do not have a fine understanding of how societies are organized and the key things that could play into a pandemic like this, uh, you, you, you most likely are not going to get it right. And in Senegal, I think one of the things that uh, they have been able to deal with uh, being a, 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 an, an extremely religious society as it is, has been to deal with the pandemic in the context of religious uh, needs of people. And uh, going by the numbers and going by the stories that we've, we, we've seen, uh, one would say they have been comparatively more successful in dealing with this than a, a whole range of other African countries. Uh, but again, I just want to conclude on the point that investing in the social capital is going to be a good thing. A young uh, colleague, a young friend of mine wrote and said, dealing with this pandemic is not about necessarily what we are going to do tomorrow, it's what we did yesterday. And I think that's a fine warning shot uh, for how we need to think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, what are some of the things that you think African governments uh, or governments in the global south have done right or are things that we should not do if we take the view that this is not an issue just about reducing uh, the spread and containing infections, but this is forcing us to look much longer term? What are some of the things that you observe that you think have been done well what are some of the things that you think we should not do uh, for those who are, are still trying to manage uh, the situation? So Ramaphosa unleashing 72,000, uh, the entire reserve, army reserve onto the streets. What, what did that achieve? Uh, you know, what are some of the other things that other countries have done that have shown sort of preemptive engagement uh, and much more strategic forward-looking uh, disaster response, for instance? I, I think um, it, it's very interesting. So if you take it conceptually and say, what's been done right, and I'll come back to the country context. The first one is those countries that have uh, managed to get certain things, that are those countries that have looked for homegrown solutions. Okay? For now, all of us have been laughing, some have been mocking Madagascar's claim uh, that they have found a uh, local plant, but if you look at the Eritrean attempt to raise money from Eritrean citizens for the purpose of this uh, uh, response, is, is that, that those homegrown solutions as a concept. Number two, the participatory approach. So of all the things that the South Africans have done well in this was Ramaphosa, who was facing a lot of challenges, as you know, before, tried to involve as many people as you could within the political spectrum, social spectrum, uh, big business, uh, taxi owners, and so on and so forth. That participatory approach uh, gave, you know, you can either earn social capital, you borrow it or steal it. I suspect that uh, in this particular context, they have been able to do all three at the same time. The third is the early preparedness. The, the Rwandese, uh, we're getting ready in December. They were making inquiries as to what the issue would be. They have their drones out in the streets. There may be questions around invasion of privacy, but the truth of the matter is they have tried to leverage local technology and technical competencies in order to do some of the things that you need to do. The fourth is what we're seeing in Senegal, homegrown, locally manufactured testing kits. The biggest scandal with the moment we are in is the following, is that 
the cost of PPE, the cost of testing kits and medical equipment. Africa will have spent more importing these things, gloves, latest gloves, and so on and so on, than it has spent on its entire healthcare systems over the last 10 years. So, and these are controlled value chains, right? They are controlled supply chains, controlled by less than 10 big corporations. So one of the things that we've seen well are those governments that are looking inward in order to have, whether it's the Kenyan ventilators uh, or uh, sanitizer produced locally. Now, the challenge with the local production approach is unless if it deliberately targets, unless it deliberately targets those who are normally excluded from the economy, right? The small to medium enterprise and the informal sector. COVID-19 will become an excuse for enriching the old boys club. It will become the biggest looting gravy train. So what we normally call disaster capitalism is on steroids in the context of COVID-19. In the sense that every human being, we're making regulations that you can't go out without wearing a mask. It may make sense in, in medical terms, but it essentially means a poor person who lives on less than a dollar a day has to go somewhere and buy a mask. Who is making these masks is the usual privileged circles. So there needs to be a revolution in that. The third thing where we are seeing people doing well is this core leadership of technical experts, which is science, uh, social leadership, which is in order to build social capital by involving people. And the third is clear political direction. Where are we going? Why are we going where we are going? But what we have seen happen, and which ought not to be done, going back to our South African cousins and brothers and sisters, is the notion that in order to recover from COVID, you need to become more nationalistic and protectionist, right? Instead of building regional value chains, instead of strengthening regional integration, this inward focus will create new forms of discrimination, otherization, xenophobia. In a region such as Sadak, which is a region made up of migrant laborers, right? And it's a historical factor. This is how the prosperity and infrastructure in Sadak was built through migrant labor. The same would be for West Africa. Africa needs to disabuse itself from the approach we are seeing in the North, that the survival is looking inwards, closing your borders. None of our economies are viable without looking outward. The third thing that I see is problematic with all the responses, but we're seeing uh, rays of hope is the notion that COVID is, was the beginning of our catastrophe. As ever Joyce and other colleagues have said, COVID simply shone the spotlight on what we failed to do for many years. But COVID became almost, to use a religious term, the social prophet that came to demonstrate how lost we were in believing in trickle down Washington consensus uh, economics, that everything would be driven by the market, that the market would solve everything. Now we have come to a moment where the surest, the surest, the surest assurance of being able to mitigate uh, against the uh, COVID overrun and also being able to transform our countries out of the COVID moment is the African people themselves. What they do, don't do, what they believe in, won't believe in, who they believe in, in terms of leadership. The last point is that COVID has also dramatized. You know, we had gotten into a moment on this continent where every idiot could become elected on the basis of a good speech, a good suit, or simply that they dance well to uh, Ndobolo. And this has demonstrated that what you need is competence. What you need is capacity. What you need is results-based leadership. So it has regenerated from Cote d'Ivoire to Burkina Faso to Mali, the question of leadership. What kind of leadership do you need? Because when faced with a crisis or pandemic of this nature, 
you can't, you don't want tomfoolery. You want people who are clear about what needs to be done. Finally, it has demonstrated the, disc the lie in our regional integration rhetoric. To this day, we are struggling to find a meaningful pan-continental or even regional, if you take East Africa and West Africa, response to COVID. We had underfunded CDC, we had underfunded everything else that matters to the daily existence of human beings. And we're spending a lot of money building airports, which now cannot function. The things that should, could save human life, like hospitals and schools, we've underinvested in. Local economic development, underinvested in. Uh, the social economy itself, underinvested in. So it seems to me that what Africa has done well is that African philanthropists, that's ordinary men and women, and even our big capitalists have woke, woke up and decided that there was no savior coming from America. And thank God for Jack Ma and others who have contributed. But the biggest contribution, if you t think in real terms, has come from Africans themselves. African women, African men, African youth. African young people are beginning to innovate how to make a mask, how to make this. And we are seeing again our governments who can't look outside for solutions beginning to look inward. And the tragedy of it is they are stealing all these COVID responses and the masks and the ventilators, taking them into their private homes and hospitals because they are afraid to go into the public hospitals. They never invested in any public hospital. So the biggest fear amongst African politicians is contracting COVID, like Boris Johnson, having to go into your own hospitals because they know what is the reality. There is no hospital they have invest, invested in, and some are even afraid to go and face local doctors because they are so poorly paid, so undervalued, that they would take a revenge on these thieves. Thank you. EJ, do you want to come in there? Thanks, and thanks, Brian. Um, I think, again, picking up on, on, on some of Brian's points, um, this is a global crisis that requires global solutions. I think this has been said many times before. And, um, you know, the next level down is the region. So, again, to bolster that point, this is a regional crisis that requires regional responses. Um, because we know that the artificial borders between our countries, um, the movement of our people across these borders is such that, you know, it, it, you, you are not going to fortify yourself inside your own national borders, no matter how much you try. And I think um, that, that, that much should be clear. I, 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 in, in, in terms of, you know, what, what can we learn, you know, from, from other places, I, I want to come back to what we already know and what we already did as the African continent. On the two pandemics that we have experienced in the past, that is HIV and AIDS, so there are some very positive. So one is the likes that we had around HIV and AIDS are not going to work. Um, and I think uh, Godwin was was talking to that, you know, pretty well. Um, but already we are seeing signs that you know, uh, you know, our government around COVID and not necessarily looking at the whole spectrum of the public health sector. Um, and everything else that goes with it, because you're not going to be containing the virus only in the COVID wards, right? Um, as, as, as we saw with, with HIV and AIDS. So we don't want medical responses. They have to be horizontal and look at the full spectrum of, um, of the health sector. Um, I think in, in, in terms of um, some of the very basic things, um, and again, we go back to this whole issue of, you know, how do you build trust? How do you build uh, rapport with, with, with communities? right? Um, if I take the case of Zimbabwe, Zanupia is doing what Zanupia does best, talking at people. You are not going to get anywhere without talking to people. And the reason I say this is for a very simple reason. You know, people will believe what they believe. 
about something that they can't see, right? A virus is something that it doesn't matter how many garing images that they, you know the newscasters try and put, you know, behind them uh, all those horrible images of the virus. But people will believe what they believe. So sooner rather than later, you're gonna have the prophets, you know, finding their voice and coming in and offering explanation. You're gonna have the traditional leaders, uh, the traditional, you know, sort of medical traditional medical people coming in with explanations. We've already seen your Magufulis, we've already seen, um, you know, Madagascar coming up with, uh, with, with uh, you know, their homegrown remedy. And by the way, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying, you know, nature hates a vacuum. So somebody's going to come up with explanation. So right now, governments need to, and civil society needs to engage people, starting with what they know, bursting some of the myths that people are already you know, holding out there and having real conversations face to face online when the space opens up, uh, you know, under the trees, as it were, because you're not going to get past the need to engage people and change, um, you know, hearts and minds. Um, I think the other thing that, that, that you know, is, is, is important is, again, as Brian was saying, is local philanthropy is already in motion, right? But we saw this with Cyclone Inai, people mobilized, they got together in churches, in, in social groups, in football clubs, and collected, uh, you know, whether it was clothing, pots and pans, etc. But what happened soon after the crisis was gone, nobody went back to those groups and tried to work with them and support them and bring them in, um, into, you know, being part of the longer term preparedness and disaster management, uh, you know, uh, emergency response uh, mechanism. I think the other area, you know, that I, I, I have to talk to as, as somebody who works in the humanitarian sector is there is a big conversation in humanitarian these days about so-called localization, right? So what they basically mean there is, um, you know, we must uh, involve more local people, their local leadership, and their local organization. Well, this is it, folks. Here is our opportunity to have real localization of the humanitarian and emergency response system. Thank goodness <laughs> there is no travel right now. The planes are not flying. So the white boys in shorts and bibs are not coming anytime soon to the continent. So this is the opportunity in terms of preparedness, in terms of working with civil society, in terms of working with local groups, which governments should seize upon and make sure that indeed localization is going to happen in this emergency, but also in, you know, in other emergencies that, that are coming along. Um, I think you know, women's movements, as always, uh, what's new, are in the forefront of doing the work, whether it's you know, being on the front line of doing the unpaid care and the home-based care and you know, every other care imaginable, we are already doing that. So again, it's to say, bring women's leadership at all kinds of levels to be part of the conversation and invest in that leadership so that women are articulating their own needs, but also the, you know, the needs of the communities and can be part of the leadership of the response. And then I think, um, finally, the issue of state accountability, right? A lot of resources have been mobilized from local philanthropy, from local people, um, people of goodwill are coming forward. I saw the other day the government of Zimbabwe is now trying to say, okay, this is how much has been donated, etc. But already people are asking, that's all very well and good, but what have you done with it, right? So fostering public accountability as part of the emergency response is going to be very important. And this is where civil society needs to come in to ensure that there is that accountability. And a lot of this we know from the work on HIV and AIDS, as I said, a lot of this we have done before in the work on Ebola. It's about engaging citizens, their movements, and the local leadership. Thank you. Thanks, EJ. Lucia, you're a lawyer. And my question to you in relation to what to do or what not to do is, are we to accept that our future is now immunity passports, technological surveillance? Should we just accept that this is the, the, the future we're headed to? I don't, I don't think we should just accept it without any conditions attached to it. I think one of the uh, worries that we have is, as we mentioned, accountability, but also that comes with transparency. So if we're looking at government implementing certain measures and um, policy, we want to make sure that it's also done in the same way that it's meant to protect um, people 
um, healthcare wise, it's also meant to protect their security, so their, their privacy, etc. So we don't want to be able to say that as long as we're walking out, this, out the street, there are military, there are police everywhere, we're no longer free to move, to have the freedom of movement that we had before. Of course, life will change, as someone mentioned before, this is a long-term um, um, pandemic. This is something that we're going to be seeing the effects for in months and maybe even years to come. But the issue is, the issue of accountability and transparency is about how the government and how polit politicians uh, in, within African uh, countries communicate with um, the with local people. So looking at, for example, one of the criticism that Angolan government has received is stating that um, a lot of the measures that have been implemented in COVID-19 relief has been looking at how to curb the spread, but also looking at how is how is healthcare, how is other healthcare communicated and how is other healthcare provided for people who are already in pre-existing pre, uh, conditions. Angola has a high child mortality rate, but in, in attached to that, now we have women, pregnant women, who are scared to go to hospitals or are even prevented to going to hospitals. How would that affect the long-standing issue with one looking at other aspects of security and making sure that people are safe, making sure that people still have access to the rights that they're supposed to have. Healthcare has has remained an issue within African countries. It's the same in Angola. Um, when we're looking at COVID-19, we many speculated at the beginning of the pandemic, like African countries will be ready to deal with a crisis like COVID-19 because of issues like that we have dealt with before, like Ebola, like malaria, etc. But we haven't seen the mass response that, we, that we're seeing in, in, in these countries. The mass government responses to implementing policies such as uh, social distancing, isolation, not prevent, preventing people to go about their daily routine and, and earning money that influences how we're going to be looking at what are rights. So implementing um, national security measures, we can't just accept that without having any conditions attached to it. We don't want to end up living in military states. And for many African countries, we already feel like we're living in a military state where the government can just come in and do whatever they want. So COVID-19 is definitely giving them the opportunity to implement measures that we wouldn't normally accept in other situations. So. I think there, there needs to be a very careful way of engaging the conversation about social uh, restrictions. So, so creating social capital is not only about making sure that we are ahead of the pandemic, but also making sure that we still hold governments accountable to what, they, the, to what they're supposed to do to protect their citizens. Okay. Serafin, would you like to add anything? I think um, the question I'm going to try to be brief but i it's difficult to talk about covid 19 cameroon without going back to the evidence that we have today of what we are all calling the failure of leadership now this is important because once you understand that it is easier to actually design some indicators of progress that we could use in future to make sure we don't always start where the default position is that our political leadership are going to fail because that's the problem that we've observed in Cameroon and the simple example that anybody can just think about and you know let me know later if that makes any sense is that all throughout the COVID-19 crisis in the modern republic we have not had the president of the republic speaking publicly about how the government is tackling the COVID-19 even once now, if you have told the Cameroonians that, oh, the president is sick, that's different. Then we know that the president is not doing it because he's sick. If you have told us that the president has traveled, that's different. But this is a country with a president in exercise who has not even bothered to talk to his citizens who are dying for the last two, three months. This is absolutely outrageous. So when you talk of failure of leadership, is not a construction, it's not an interpretation of reality. It's the total absence of the leader to lead the people in the moment of really, really terrible crisis. Once we go from that as something that should not be, but that is right now in the case of Cameroon, we must therefore think about what kind of leadership 
are we going to be expecting or to actually emulate in Africa learning from COVID-19? I think we need to define a number of indicators that we need to be able to look across. And this is not just about governance. We want a leadership that should be present as needed, even though actually the default position is that political leadership should be there all the time. We want leadership, political leadership, that should be supportive, doing things that will help the communities and the country move forward. We need leadership, and going from Cameroon is all across a number of countries. Maybe the case of Cameroon is both worse in terms of the number of cases of COVID-19 you know, uh, patients that we have, but also in terms of maybe being the worst leadership we have, because we have a dictatorship clearly. He's been in power for 39 years now. So that's how bad it is. But we need different type of political leadership, which is not just present, as I've said, supportive, but it must be a proactive leadership where they actually interact with the communities and the civil society, and they must show some minimum coordination in phases of crisis. The second thing that I would want to uh, contribute, which is about what else do we learn from this? What else should we emulate for the future? There must be a sort of a better connection and collaboration with the diaspora. In the case of Cameroon, the stronger response that is having a massive impact in the community is the work done by the diaspora in putting together a massive fund which today has you know, collected more than half a million euros, which is being used directly back home. But there's a lot in there, and we may have another time to go deeper into why this experience is really, really something to look into more closely. Because, for example, let's take something like the masks. The diaspora initiative trying to help with COVID-19 in Cameroon is saying we will use all this money to buy the masks locally to make sure we support local economy in producing this mass locally than just importing it and then pumping all of this money which is collected in Europe, in the Americas, back in Europe and in America. They are saying, no, we can produce the mass locally. We know the international standards for mass. There is enough material locally. We just need to develop a system where there is transparency. You follow the international standards. And that's having a massive impact because right here, right now, that's not just the big, you know, corporations making money out of COVID, that money will actually help develop the local economy in some ways. So that's something that we can learn a lot from in the specific case of Cameroon. And I think across a number of African countries, there is a lot that we can learn once we, again, that's why I wanted to correct when you were talking, I didn't want to interrupt. The problem is not the politicization of what I think is essentially medical. It's when it is over-politicized to the point that it actually prevents us to see the economic and socio-cultural aspect that would be beneficial because of over-politicization. So it is the over-politicization that is my problem because you cannot escape the fact that everything about COVID-19 and is between Africa is essentially political is first. It's when you over-politicize it that you start now actually dwarfing the other aspects that are important. So there is a lot that we can learn from how not just the politicians and the political institutions, but the civil society, the diaspora all over Europe and, you know, the Americas and Asia is going back to help the community and there's massive lot to learn from that thank you seraphine so godwin we're hearing about diaspora engagement local philanthropy learning from previous pandemics and the sort of approaches that have been taken before around that thinking very critically around uh, the ways in which legislation can be used as, as an entry point for much longer term uh, shifts in a society if civil society engagement is not uh, if we are not on board or really uh, holding governments accountable in terms of the laws that are being changed now in order to help government address COVID-19. In Kenya in particular, I've observed, for instance, the return of radio programs as part of the mechanism to teach uh, kids who are in public schooling. 
So there hasn't been a reliance on internet, but on radio programs, which is something I grew up with as a child. Uh, I've also observed, for instance, the fact that as a result of this, you're seeing the government being forced to you know, ensure some kind of equitable access to water in, uh, in uh, informal settlements. So my question, and this is a sort of final wrap up question to the group before we open up, is that are, are these openings things that we can sustain? Are these, are, are these openings um, uh, an opportunity for us to actually reopen conversations, for instance, around the 15, the Abuja Declaration, you know, around 15% investment on health by governments? Uh, is this an opportunity for us to rethink our education model in, the country, in our countries? Is this an opportunity for conversations around universal access? How do we use this opportunity you know, to expand uh, some of these structural um, debates that uh, most of you uh, on this conversation have been ha having for the longest time? Uh, Awina, I think that uh, uh, if there is any big lesson that uh, for me is coming out of all these developments is uh, a question of uh, do we own our healthcare systems? Okay. Um, and I think related to that question is uh, the second question, which we have said too many times, and I, I think we tend to forget that uh, the state is absolutely important in the provision of healthcare, but the state is absolutely important in the provision of basic social welfare needs of people. Uh, many of us have wondered at what point the world will accept this simple reality. Uh, and uh, really do away with the, um, a wasteful debate that takes us into uh, private sector, neoliberal approaches to healthcare, education, and all these things. I think that if there is any big point that is coming up, whether you are in a country like Cameroon where the state is underperforming, or you are in a country where uh, the systems are too militarized, the state is too strong and authoritarian that it makes it difficult for people to operate. Or whether you are in um, countries where things are relatively okay, uh, I think the big question that we have to deal with is going to be, how do we use the state to define a healthcare system that responds to the needs of communities? Um, at the end of the day, uh, we must acknowledge uh, one thing, that there are many African countries that do not own their healthcare systems. Uh, and uh, there are a whole number of countries where our healthcare priorities are defined by donors rather than uh, by, 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 um, by, by our governments. And so at the end of the day, uh, yes, the Abuja uh, protocol is, 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 was right onto the mark, but let's remember that the, this, this, these are protocols that were built on the basis save of the Lagos Plan of Action, which had an emphasis on community participation, which had an emphasis on the role of the state and which attempted to define an African position in relation to many of the development needs that, uh, that we had. So I think that the challenge for Africa is not so much um, that uh, we don't know where we want to go. I think the challenge is that we've not implemented uh, many of the agreed upon uh, priorities that we need to. And going forward, I think the, 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 the COVID uh, um, uh, instance is reminding us that uh, unless and until we define our own priorities in relation to healthcare, in relation to schooling, in relation to many of these things, it's going to be almost impossible for us to, 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 to manage. Uh, the radio is fine and all these things that we are doing in relation to our education system is fine. But the consequence of it is that uh, unless we are going to develop uh, and invest in the people who actually do the teaching in the doctors who are doing this, uh, the nurses, and more importantly, perhaps we haven't said this enough, uh, investing in community health. Because there are many places on the continent where the only access uh, to anything that would help you deal with the medical or uh, a health issues within communities, right? So beginning to invest in some of these uh, zones is going to be absolutely important for us. But for us to do that, first of all, we need to help to own our healthcare systems. Uh, E.J. Brian, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, you know, we actually need to broaden this discussion deliberately. So uh, we can, what we are calling healthcare system is looking at the personnel and the infrastructure. 
and the policies that govern this. But one of the biggest scandals is that we privatized all our uh, companies that produce medicines. So we may end up owning these shells, but importing everything that is required to keep them going. So this idea of an industrialization model that's not linked to our welfare and well-being model is key. And, and so we must answer that because it answers the question of youth employment. It answers the question of uh, industrialization. The, the second thing, the biggest scandal that's happened in Africa, Awino, is that in the 80s and 90s, we were talking about how to link economic and social policy. So the big discussion was social policy. The donors said, no, 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 that's a nebulous concept. Why don't we focus on something that we can touch and feel? So we went to social protection, right? Uh, cash, uh, what do you call this? Cash grants, payments. And uh, my Eva Dress and Co. will tell you, some, some of us protested and said, you are treating African poverty, or rather impoverishment, because it's a poverty manufactured by unjust power, right? You are treating it the same way you treat people who are broke, right? That there is a month end that comes and they will, you know, they'll be okay. This is a structural problem. If you're dealing with the structural problem, so let's address it as such. So I think that we need to have a robust conversation because when we start saying health for all, this for all, we're missing the holistic approach to social policy. Let, let me give you a sense. If I live in Kibera, for example, you can have a functional hospital with 10 doctors with everything that's needed in the hospital, I wouldn't have been able to comply with the COVID uh, requirements. Why? Because I have no decent shelter. Why? Because so many of us have to share flying toilets or a pit latrine. Why? Because I can't wash my hands because there is no water. Why? Because some goons have privatized water. So if I live in um, Vaiga, I'm able to get potable water out of a tap. But if I live in Korogosho, or the, I have to buy water. So when you ask me to be constantly washing my hands, you, you are penalizing my poverty. You are criminalizing my poverty. The burden on the poor has been heavier in order to comply with the COVID. So the opening that stays for us to renegotiate comprehensive social policy that will look at water and sanitation, that will look at shelter, at education, at food. I mean, we import, we import annually. 35 billion US dollars worth of food annually. Now you tell me why Africa with some of the best soils imports 35 billion US dollars worth of food. There are countries that have not invested in agriculture at all. There are governments that have privatized the entire agricultural enterprise. They, we have not invested at all in the smallholder farmer, right? So, and it's part of resolving the question of women's access to land and other productive resources. We privatize seed for goodness sake. And we moved into this hyper fascination with chemical fertilizers and poisoned not only the soil, but we poisoned underground water sources. So it seems to me that if the opportunity, the real opportunity is to answer the question, what kind of African development, not only owned and driven by the Africans, but that would be beneficial to the continent in the long term, do we need to be driving? How do we get an African Development Bank and African financial institutions to invest in a development that's inward looking, that's not outward looking, exporting jobs, and that looks for external saviors? And that is the fundamental crisis. Our social policy is almost non existent. And related to the social policy, Ever Joyce and, and colleagues here were talking about the humanitarian response and preparedness, right? The real opportunity at the moment is how do people become the main drivers of a response so that we are not waiting for America to save us, for Europe to save us, but we can save ourselves as we are seeing that. The last thing is that I think the bigger opportunity, and I think Gordon, you talked about it, and Lucia and uh, Seraphine, uh, you know, we had huge debates about public goods. Right? Those debates somehow dissipated and everything was capable of privatization. Where in this moment where the biggest scandal is that in the absence of public goods, 
we cannot guarantee public health or public security. COVID is just one crisis where health has huge security dimensions. Tomorrow it may be water or something else. So if we're to build Africa's resilience and capacity to deal with these things, I'll say let's attend to public goods, public leadership, and public resources. How do we resource our own development? And how do we resource our own priorities? This is the biggest policy space ever created for African governments. And unfortunately, as Godwin has already said, because we abandoned the things that would have helped us, liquidity is a challenge. Our governments have, do not have enough money to generate a domestic response to COVID-19. And cancellation of debt will not provide sufficient results or sufficient resources for this. And that's why the rethink, and Eva Joyce mentioned it earlier, it's a global challenge requiring global solutions, but more importantly, it's a regional problem that require regional solutions. And in finding the regional solutions, you build on the local capacity, competence, expertise, resilience, experience but you also build on the regional, uh, uh, if you like, competitive and comparative advantage that we have. And, and, and for me, that is it. Thanks, EJ. I just want to make one point, um, and I think it's about civil society. If, if anything else that has been good about this crisis, it's to remind civil society actors like ourselves, uh, many of us on this call, that no single issue organizing is ever sufficient. We said education was the answer, it was never the answer. We then said, I don't know, women's political participation was the answer, we said it was insufficient. So this crisis is showing us that our tendency to take every single thing that we start working on, whatever the flavor of the year is, these days it's climate. Um, but look at how climate has suddenly gone on to the edges of, of the conversation. So we need to organize across movements. We need to have an intersectional analysis and intersectional approach because this is what is needed, what has always been needed because there are no magical uh, bullet answers to some of the deep-seated structural issues that our continent faces. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to open it up for any questions or comments from those who are participating. Uh, Seraphim, there's a question that came up for you, which is around the, uh, what uh, the implications of COVID-19 for the ongoing crisis in Cameroon. Um, if you could offer some comments on that. Yeah, I will quickly say that it has just worsened things because the crisis in Cameroon is at, uh, there are two layers. There's a political crisis, which is about what is happening with a president who has been in power for 38 years and who actually, you know, there's a debate. So there's the main political crisis about the current government and if they are really the legitimate government. But the aspect of the humanitarian crisis, which is the war in two of the Anglophone provinces of the country, and this has been going on for literally four years now. It's not spoken about in the Western media. I contacted the BBC and I wanted them to cover it and suddenly they didn't show any interest. But you can see the numbers of the war. We are talking of thousands of casualties, thousands of people who have been displaced into Nigeria as war refugees. And the those two provinces are totally permanently literate with body. Anybody who Googles the war in Southwest Cameroon will see horrible images that will traumatize you for quite some days. And you can try that after this conversation. COVID-19, it has made things worse for the two provinces where there is war right here, right now in Cameroon. And this war is serious because it is not Cameroonians. It is not the diaspora. It is not you know, me or you who actually uh, told the United Nations to declare Cameroon as back as 2017 to be in humanitarian crisis. And we know the criteria that leads the United Nations to declare a region in humanitarian crisis 
It's about how many people are dying, who are civilians, who are victims in case of, you know, something like a war. So Cameroon has been in a situation of humanitarian crisis for more than three years now. And COVID-19 is only making things worse in those regions because we do not even have the data on these provinces, nothing reliable. So that's really, things are bad in the two provinces. The two former uh, English-speaking provinces of Cameroon under what was known in the days as the British Cameroons. So those are the two regions we're talking about. I'm not even going into Boko Haram and what they've been doing between Cameroon Nigeria and Chad and Niger. So that's another dimension that is only getting worse with COVID-19. Thanks, Seraphim. Uh, somebody asks about the, um, the Madagascar drug. I, I don't know who has been following that and whether you have any comment on that. Is this, you know, a potential here that we must take seriously? Godwin, you are smiling widely. You want to offer comment on that? Uh, not, 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 not really in the sense in which the question is asked, because uh, um, I'm not in a position to comment directly on uh, on uh, on the drug. But I guess the point there is, uh, what are the homegrown solutions to to this challenge, and what make, what infrastructure do we have? Uh, first of all, to to to, to make sure that. Uh, many of the solutions that are coming in uh, homegrown are, are good and number two, they can be used uh, in the context. I think part of the challenge that uh, I, I think we face in Africa is that every time there is a, um, uh, you know, uh, something that uh, comes up from our own innovations, the first thing is to deal with it from a comparative perspective uh, and begin to, to doubt our own capacities to find homegrown solution best simply on the fact that uh, we are used to externally imported solutions to into our so um, while we are not able at the moment to talk directly about uh, this particular uh, drug from Madagascar, I think that uh, keeping an open mind as to be able to um, to essentially begin to embrace solutions that are our own would be uh, 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 my way of going about it and. Uh, I would say that uh, we have ways of beginning to test this and we have ways of knowing if it's efficacious. And I think that the, the opportunity presented by this particular instance is one thing that we should work uh, around. Thanks, there's a, a question from Catherine McConney around how to hold uh, you know, two things at the same time, right? There are deep structural inequalities and gaps that have been exposed by COVID-19. How do we hold a conversation on that and the need to resolve those structural inequalities whilst uh, continuing uh, to address the spread and manage uh, COVID-19? Um, any, any thoughts or reflections on that? You know, because I think sometimes governments will say too, too many complaints, too many critiques. We need to focus on the, on the problem at hand. Civil society, you know, hold your horses, allow us to do our job. Uh, um, which might therefore, you know, constrain opportunities for dialogue. Um, EJ, I see you nodding. You want to take that? Sure. Um, again, I go back to HIV and AIDS. Um, <laughs> we've had experience on how to do that. Mm. I think it's, yes, it's important to continue to engage with immediate needs, making sure that, you know, those needs are being met and being addressed, but at the same time, and this is where it gets tricky, making sure that that immediate response is, is being done with an eye towards the future, right? Um, and is being done in such a way that it, it tackles uh, some of the structural issues. And I think, you know, on this, on this call, we, we've talked to some of that. So, you know, sitting as I am currently in South Africa, you know, for example, you can already see, you know, where the conversation is going. In the early days, it was kind of like, you know, we are all in this together, let's fight together. But now that the interests of capital, the interests you know, of, of white people are the ones rising to the surface, you are beginning to see, right, the, the, those fissures and black people saying, um, you know, you're not going far enough, right? The most excluded segment of the society saying, you're not, you're not going far enough. There is a lot more to be done. Um, and one segment of the population saying, oh, no, 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 you know, this has gone too far now, right? And, and, and so that's where, you know, it's important, um, even as we look at the practical, the immediate, 
um, you have an eye towards the strategic and, and, and the longer term. And again, we know this from women's rights work. There's a question from Sarah Mukasa, which I will, there are two questions from Sarah. Okay, so I will save the first one for, uh, for last uh, to wrap up our conversation together. So uh, if you could just take a note of this so that I don't go through them one by one. There's something about strengthening regional integration vis-a-vis -vis nationalization and internalization. So the point you made, Brian, earlier about the tendency for this crisis to regenerate ultra-nationalist sentiments and the weaknesses of our regional economic communities. How, uh, what is the work that is needed there going forward? Uh, there is a question about Africa's relationship to China, in, uh, as, uh, especially now with the rise of cases of xenophobia and racism in China and our indebtedness uh, to uh, some of us, our country's indebtedness to China. Any reflections on that? Will that shift? Uh, will that open up opportunities for more um, equitable conversations with China? Uh, there is a question around Africa's capacity to resist external influence and do the kind of um, rethinking of the kind of Africa development we want. Um, do we have the capacity to do that? What does the African Union, for instance, need to look like and do um, to enable that? That's another question that you might want to take up. Uh, there is a question around securitization and the violation of citizens uh, under the guise of dealing with a COVID-19. Um, and how this therefore entrenches, um, let's see, the entrenchment of security forces into the economies of our countries through local mask production. So I think the interface between capital, securitization, uh, local economies, and uh, the tension that exists between these sets of dynamics in a number of our African countries. Let's, let's take those and then come back to the chat in a bit. Um, China's relationship with Africa. Is there anything yeah. likely to shift in this particular moment? Yeah, I, I think that um, there are two things that are driving the China-Africa narrative. One is the usual xenophobia, which is uh, driven also by the West, uh, and, and therefore China is the enemy of everything. The second thing driving the China-Africa narrative is the, the uh, practical objective the reality and experience of Africans in China and on the continent. Uh, the challenge is that up to now, the eighth FOCAC, which is the premise upon which the partnership is couched, was literally given to African leaders by uh, China. There was no conversation, no dialogue of the framing of the eight principles in the, of the various principles in that. And I think that African citizens are going to take a lot more interest in how to ensure that that framework of cooperation is subject to some set of agreed rules and also open to some scrutiny. And I saw the letter by the Africa Human Rights Defenders to the chairperson of the African Union and also observed what the Ghanaian, the Nigerians, and the African Union, uh, African Commission said about the racism in China. The biggest challenge in China-Africa relations is that it's been government to government. There's never really been effective people-to-people -people connections between China uh, and Africa. And the attempts to establish Confucian institutes is insufficient to establish a people-to-people -people connection. So I think that is where that connection ought to happen. There are issues of accountability of Chinese corporates and other actors. There are issues of violations of rights. There are issues of racism. There are issues of opacity in some of the agreements. There are issues of illicit financial outflows. There are issues of spying. There are issues, all sorts of criminal and other activities. But there are also instances where China invests a huge amount into the continent, but those investments are not accounted for by the political class because of the opacity. And if Beijing really wants to be a friend of Africa and Africans, as opposed to a friend of African dictators, and that framework of cooperation needs to be opened up to certain principles, certain values, and a monitoring and evaluation framework, which would bring me to 
the conflation of what we are calling the African private sector, African militaries or security sector, and also the political elite. I think that we have an opportunity in this as citizens. Uh, and, and because part of the procurement that we've seen for COVID-19 across the continent has tended to favor people who, because it's been a militarized response for the most part, the dominance of the military element in the procurement process, or business persons who are aligned uh, to military heavyweights or the, have, have been. So there is a need in looking at the procurement for COVID because we can start there. Uh, to raise issues of accountability and transparency and also abuse because they are using donor money to do the procurement to enrich their, their, their friends, which would essentially mean if you turn this back inwards, and that is where the solution of a regionalized uh, uh, approach would work, it's most unlikely that the sort of opacity and grand level corruption will be about because the local entrepreneurs who for now have been locked up under lockdown will take an interest. The open bidding and competitive bidding process will take an interest. I think there is something in this conversation that we must uh, be careful of. We're all talking as though COVID will end next week or in three months time. It's unlikely, uh, right? Uh, so if we're in for the next year or more, and the impact certainly will be much longer than that. Our mindset, there is no short-term intervention. This is not Cyclone Idai, which has come and gone, and we're living with the aftermath. This is, if you like, a moving disaster that's growing each day. And because of that, some of the things that Ever Joyce uh, was pointing us to is we've got to literally do hybrid interventions at the same time, right? Intervene to solve structural issues which exacerbate vulnerability and also intervene to deal with the immediate livelihood concerns. And I think that is not just the role of the state, that is a state in partnership with citizens. We are seeing in places, uh, small places in Zimbabwe, like Blaue, or where business people, churches, civil society, and everybody has come together in what is called I am for Blaue against COVID-19. And they are raising resources, but they are also putting their doctors to use in terms of getting the medical and putting politicians across the political divide working together. I saw a similar response in Senegal, where we're seeing the use of faith leaders, political leaders, we're seeing creative things and the diaspora. And the biggest hindrance, and ironically so, for that response that I'm advocating for, is we came up with regulations on money laundering, laudable regulations, and uh, our lawyer colleagues may help us here. They are making it impossible for Ever Joyce locked up in Johannesburg to be moving money across to Zimbabwe, right? Or moving goods if you are a small timer. So they tend to privilege particular type of actors with particular type of access. And I, I'm sure the Cameroonian diaspora that is trying to move resources and the Eritrean diaspora, the Nigerian diaspora is meeting with huge obstacles that are related to rules, right? We need to think, rethink these rules on how do we do solidarity support, how do we leverage and harvest, but how do we also make global demands? So one of the demands is the cost of remitting money from Europe is huge. And lastly, global solidarity in this. We are looking at the racism in China, the highest number of people dying. In fact, I was saying to colleagues yesterday, there have been more Zimbabweans dying in London of COVID-19 than there have been Zimbabweans dying in Zimbabwe, officially, of COVID-19. Healthcare workers from the developing world, persons of color in the United States. So there is a global solidarity that needs to be built amongst persons of color because a hierarchy of humanity has been recreated. A hierarchy of humanity where persons of color, because of historical structural issues, we are going to, whatever pandemic comes, we're going to be the biggest victims. And our victimhood is not linked to our skin color but to the discrimination and racism in the design of economies and social policy. Thank you, Brian. EJ, there are a couple of questions around civil society mobilization, movement building, and how to capitalize on this moment. And one uh, that is specifically around GBV and violence against women at, at this particular moment. If you'd like to take those. What can civilians do? 
to demand and ensure that conditions attached to future control are not sustained. Uh, you spoke about no single issue organizing. What, what, what should movements do at this particular moment? Are there examples that you're seeing that you'd like to surface for us? That could sure. like that, yeah. Thanks. Um, so I think one, um, in terms of how movements are or can work together, um, and I would just cite a couple of examples. So one is already you know, you've seen feminists coming together with trade unions, working together around issues around women's labor. So not just looking at, you know, the formal labor, but also unpaid care, um, which, you know, which has become a big issue as, 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 as we've been mentioning in this conversation. Um, I think you are beginning to see a lot more coalescing, right, around the climate justice uh, conversation, because it's not just about you know, uh, climate or the atmosphere. It's also about food. It's about, you know, women's rights. It's about uh, humanitarian response. So again, you know, there is, uh, there, is, there is a lot of, you know, coming together there and, and young people, um, you know, have been leading the charge as, as, as we've seen in, 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 in many places. Um, so I think it, it, it can be done. There are some small moves around this. Um, I don't want to make it sound like there is, you know, there's a lot of big ones. Um, but I think there is um, enough examples for us to build on um, and, and do that deliberately. And again, you know, this moment offers us, you know, that opportunity. So wherever we get opportunities to organize, to talk about the impacts of COVID, we need to make sure that we are being deliberate in who is around the table, who is talking to who, and how do we make sure that, you know, we are all um, as much as possible talking to, uh, talking to each other in, in, in the process. Um, I didn't quite get the question around uh, gender-based violence. Sorry, I couldn't see the chat. It's around the fact that many activists and women's rights organizations have been pointing to the fact of increased violence against women because people are now locked into homes and spaces that are risky um, and which they don't have an opportunity to move out of. Is this a trend sure. that's also being observed in Africa? This is definitely a trend. Um, South Africa, where I'm sitting, as, as you know, um, that's an issue that's come up. And uh, fortunately, in this place, there is a system in place, a system is in place for tracking, you know, for um, keeping up with the numbers. And definitely in terms of how the state is, you know, giving out information on what are the trends and what's going on, that's something that uh, information is being shared. Um, and again, on Zimbabwe, where I was talking to, um, a lot of work being done by existing women's organizations. Um, uh, example of you know, an organization like Musasa, which has reported seeing an increase, uh, not only in the numbers, but also in, 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 the, in the needs for shelter. Um, and so again, having to partner with uh, a lot more people to, to, to make that happen. So certainly, yes, there is um, you know, a trend across you know, many different African countries. I've just you know, given those two. Um, but I think the important, you know, issue again there to say is this is an important moment and it's an opportunity also for us to fight for an increase in state resources, in, in, in um, you know, investment um, in terms of making sure that there are facilities um, that the state itself is able to respond, um, including the, you know, the justice system. Um, you know, et cetera. And, and this is a moment, you know, uh, that, 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 that we may not see again. So it's important to, 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 to make sure that we make uh, use of this opportunity. Thank you. Um, Brian, might you, Brian or Godwin, might you have or want to offer commentary on the test kit in Senegal and whether it's being rolled out to the rest of the continent? Uh, yes, Go ahead, yes, Brian. Brian. No, no, not yet. I think that, uh, as I understand, there are two types of tests that have to be done. Uh, they suspect it will be ready soon for rollout throughout the continent. Uh, there's a the rapid test, but they have another second test that you have to be able to do both. Uh, to say it to uh, uh, if you like to clinically uh, 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 prove that a person doesn't have COVID. Thank you. So, Thank you. yeah, but there are already people starting to order uh, 
or inquiring about ordering uh, from Senegal because of the price. Um, yeah. Okay. Godwin, there was a question about what is it about the way in which Senegal has mobilized the religious community that has worked? Because in other countries, uh, somebody talked about Spain, where religious groups have felt uh, excluded from the conversation. What is it that Senegal did? Uh, is it just basically the fact that the country is organized around religion, so there's no other way around it? Or was there something uh, unique about the Senegal approach? Um, I, I think there's something historically unique about the Sen Senegal approach that compared to perhaps many other places uh, in Africa that, uh, that I have. Uh, I've lived in Senegal now for, for three years. Uh, and uh, one of the things that immediately strikes you living there is how much uh, both Christian and Muslim populations live alongside each other in ways perhaps that uh, uh, you don't see in many other countries, including my own country, uh, Kenya. Uh, and uh, I think that right from the days of uh, Seda Senkor, the way the, the levels of religious tolerance uh, between religions, but also between the state uh, and, uh, and, and different religious uh, groups, uh, perhaps is much, much better developed. So that what you are seeing now is built on a, a sound basis of, um, of, of historic uh, relationships built over time. And uh, I mean, anyone who has lived in Senegal also will, will very easily notice uh, the, the sense in which the state respects uh, religious uh, groups and organizations and the religious beliefs of people and the way in which uh, different politicians, but perhaps also really the, the presidents, different presidents of Senegal, the way they relate uh, to the different religious groups. Um, you ignore religion, religion in Senegal, you ignore as perhaps the, one of the most important singular basis of building legitimacy in politics. And uh, so I'm not surprised that it's happening now. Uh, I'm actually, when I spoke about uh, social capital at the start of this discussion, uh, religion has been a, an important basis for building this capital in Senegal. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's become a useful basis for, for dealing with what would otherwise have been a devastating uh, pandemic in that country. Thank you very much. It's uh, 1531 here in London, so I would like to wrap up. And I want to wrap up by just offering each of the panelists an opportunity to close out with a final comment, your final core messages. Um, and again, just thanking everyone once again for joining us for what has been a very insightful conversation. So let me start with you, Lucia. Final messages uh, or closing uh, statement. My final thoughts would be like would be on how governments are interacting with COVID-19 relief. So looking at healthcare implementations and comments um, that, for example, people in Angola have said is. Um, has the Ministry of Health become the Ministry of COVID? Are we just focusing solely on COVID-19 and not really looking beyond what we already mentioned during the session is what opportunities is it can bring in dealing, for example, with malaria, what is a big issue in Angola. So, <coughs> excuse me. My reservations are that we perhaps are expecting too much to come out of the responses that we can get from our African governments more so because, as um, Seraphine mentioned, if you look at governments who are not responding at all, who are not engaging with their, um, with their citizens directly, if you have a president who's been in power for 38 years and who hasn't addressed the nation in whatever capacity when dealing with a pandemic, you have to wonder what the political uh, expectations are for people, but also the political expectation for those involved in um, the relief. So are we just doing this to say that we are taking actions and that, that we are trying to prevent the, um, the disease to spread even more? Are we doing this in, in the way that we think that is going to prevent future disasters? I think for um, Angola specifically, one of the biggest motivation for the current government has been the elections in 2022. So a response to COVID-19 
sets the sets the groundwork for how the how people will respond to any type of engagement with the current government. So making sure that governments are not only um, accountable but also reliable in their support and in their responses. So that would be my uh, final thoughts on this: making sure that we hold governments not only accountable but we so but we can also actually rely on the implementation of positive change and long-term change. Thank you. Seraphine? Yes, I mean, there's a number of things that I would touch on, but very, very quickly. First of all, the whole idea that many governments are not responding because of lack of resources, that must be challenged. And I'll just give a simple example with Cameroon. The fund set up by the prime minister was uh, to the amount of one million pounds equivalent. The money that was asked by the same government for the party at the presidency at Christmas last year was 1.5 million pounds. So the problem with even dealing with COVID-19 with the resources that African government have is about allocation of resources, not the law of resources. The second thing I want to just you know, close with is the whole is it, it actually is related to the question of Toby Fani Coyote about what we have to expect from our government. We must make our government accountable, but base it on, as Brian said, on our welfare. We must do that. Nobody will do that for us. So COVID-19 should get African communities aware of the necessity to have government that will be accountable, but government whose agency is turned towards the citizens of Africa. If we don't do that, nobody is going to do it. So COVID-19 is telling us that it's time to act for our interests. So that's one of the key things that we need to take moving forward, because even to deal with the COVID-19 now, we need to take responsibility. Citizens, civil society, the governments are lagging behind clearly in many cases, with the case of Cameroon being one case in point, but civil society must take responsibility. Scholars must help, uh, researchers must join in because that's the only way forward from what we are looking at all over the continent. Thank you, Seraphim. EJ. This is a collective problem that requires collective solutions at all levels, from the national level, you know, from the community level, to the national levels, to the regional level, to the global level, as we have said. Secondly, it's important to involve the people and talk with the people and their movements and organizations and not to talk at people because people know what the problem is. They will have the solutions. And if governments and civil society take the people seriously, this is one of the surest ways in which we will be able to deal with COVID. This is a moment in which we need to fight for public goods, in particular public services, health, and education in particular. And I want to add, this is a moment, particularly for countries like Zimbabwe, to go back to issue-based politics and not just the politics of who we like or who we dislike less than the other. So our conversations online, offline, have to be about the basic issues that are facing many of our people today. And those are issues around access and uh, the use of public resources so that we are all able to access um, the help that we need, uh, particularly from the public health sector and public education. Um, finally, I want to say, um, in order to do all of this, we must guard against stigma and discrimination. We saw how because of stigma and discrimination, we almost lost the fight against HIV and AIDS. We had the same experience with Ebola, and we lost so many years, if not decades, in which we could have responded and HIV and AIDS would not have been um, as catastrophic as it ended up being on our continent. We have the opportunity with COVID, but already signs are that there is a lot of stigma, a lot of discrimination, 
much of it being peddled, unfortunately, by the media and people who should know better. We have to guard against stigma and discrimination and playing the blame game. Otherwise, once again, we will lose a lot of time, we will lose a lot of momentum in which we could have made change happen. Thanks, what do we need, finally, in terms of leadership, let me say it, the kind of leadership that the world needs today, it has a name, it's called feminist leadership. Thank you, EJ, thank you. Uh, Godwin, your closing comments, and if you could say something about African universities, if you can, and research. Uh, Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Awima. I think that um, uh, if there is one big lesson that I would want to carry out from this discussion uh, is that um, we need a shift in our mindsets. Um, and, and that shift must be a shift that uh, allows us to put at the center of, uh, of this discussion around COVID uh, the fact that our problem is not a, f a problem of funding. Our problem is not a, pro a, 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 a medical problem. Our problem is uh, beginning to center our priorities uh, as a people. And I think um, Brian did uh, make this, uh, this point and uh, I would like to piggyback on it. Uh, it's really a point about reconceptualizing ourselves uh, in the context of our Pan-African hood. Uh, and beginning to see the sense in which there are inbuilt solidarities that are useful to uh, reformulating our thinking and shifting our mindset in a way uh, that allows us uh, um, uh, to, to, to do the right thing. And uh, the, the place of research uh, is going to be absolutely important. The need uh, to invest in, 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 in forms of knowledge that uh, allow us to put those priorities, African priorities at the forefront is going to be absolutely important. Um, uh, over the last couple of, of, of days uh, sitting uh, uh, in Codesria, uh, I have received numerous, numerous invitations to participate in uh, meetings, uh, to partner with institutions to do different things. And one of the things that uh, has made it extremely difficult for me to operate has been that we hardly know in, in, in real data sense what we are dealing with in the context of this pandemic. And yet we have partnership proposals that uh, want to find solutions to, uh, to an issue that we hardly understand. Uh, and so for me, I think African universities have an opportunity to begin to, to build uh, new forms of knowledge that uh, would help us understand what we are dealing with, uh, not uh, in the broad sense of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, but really in the broad sense of how that pandemic interacts with the uh, different uh, contexts that we deal with on the, uh, that we have to deal with on the continent. Um, this would be a sound basis for beginning to, to, to build a, a knowledge base uh, that would actually bring out the priorities that we need to. And I think if there's any government on the continent that uh, hasn't gotten the, the message, uh, the message is uh, a little bit simple and clear and uh, perhaps COVID is helping us do this. It is that if you are going to continue over investing in what you call the hard sciences, the biological sciences and ignore the social sciences, the humanities, you've missed the boat. If you cannot uh, comprehend the diversities around which this pandemic is having to deal with us, uh, you have missed the boat. And I think that uh, better partnerships are going to have to bring an interdisciplinary approach that appreciates the different dimensions of the issues that we are dealing with. I do not think that uh, the infrastructure has, is, is, is really there from outside Africa to deal with this question. I think research institutions on the continent are going to have to do this and uh, um, that is the only way that we are going to, to, to shift this mindset that I'm thinking about. So the mindset shift is critical, absolutely critical. Uh, to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian, your final um, messages? Oh, sorry, sorry. You can hear me? Yeah. 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 African elites who have been disconnected from African citizens uh, and African institutions that have existed largely to service the needs of external actors and funders. Uh, 
find themselves uh, uh, now in a, uh, a moment where they need to align uh, objectives because they have only each other uh, to fight COVID-19. Uh, we may not like the state and status of the African Union and the regional economic communities, uh, but that's what we have as that blunt uh, instrument is what we have. We, we have only Africa, CDC, and our dilapidated health infrastructure and systems to fight this. So in a sense, all of us need to introspect and think about Africa's exclusion from global diagnostics market, Africa's exclusion from global uh, supply chains, Africa's exclusion from global development finance and global governance, whether it's the UN Security Council, Africa's exclusion from global solidarity, other than what you have seen from Jack Ma and a few people. So in a sense, this forces Africa to focus again on the conversation of Africa's place in the globe and how the race to the bottom, where we approach the world as single little non-fiable states is unlikely to guarantee our safety and security in the face of a pandemic any other pandemic other than COVID-19. And then number two is let's assure the things that can be assured. So even in this morass, even in this uh, pain we are in, the biggest threat we face is food insecurity, right? As for reasons that Eva Joyce mentioned earlier. Let's, in our recovery, let's not copy and paste this idea that we're pouring billions of dollars into the big private sector we should be giving the local food producer sufficient resources to produce resources that we can put in grain and food banks so that Africa does not employ, import a huge amount of food. You know, the principle that uh, the late Tajuddin and others used to say, we import, uh, we, we grow what we do not eat and, uh, 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 and we eat what we don't grow. And as a result, we are slaves of those who grow what we eat. So there is an opportunity for us to deal with Africa's food sovereignty as a, as a, as a defense, not just for COVID-19, but the other insecurities. The second, African people. I think COVID-19 exposed the extent of underinvestment in critical professions in our nations, and also in data, in statistics. In, um, so what we need to do is to look inward. These are things that within six to 10 years, we will have started making some difference. We have underinvested in African institutions of knowledge, in African civil society. None of our governments give resources of any significant nature to civil society. So as a result, you have a hostility that exists between government and civil society, where governments that are foreign funded see civil society, which is foreign funded, as an enemy. And what happens to local resources? They are looted by the same governments and they are banked in tax havens and overseas jurisdictions. So there is a time for us to relook. Even African thieves need to become Pan-Africanists now. You know, they need to realize that if you don't invest in the continent for your healthcare and your security, if we have another pandemic that stops you from being able to travel, you will die out of foolishness and your money will take long, as has happened with Abacha's money, to be repatriated back to benefit any of your people or, or, or relatives. And, and then the other thing that we need to do is rethink security. I think COVID-19 has demonstrated health as a security issue. If you ask what our thoughts about security were, soldiers running around with guns, with tanks, unfortunately those tanks and the amounts of money we spend buying that hardware is unable to defend Africa. So, our imagination of what security will look like going forward needs to be expanded. And also what defense looks like going forward needs to be expanded. We've been exposed to this and I want to end by saying, it seems to me that out of all this, the game changer is leadership, right? And citizenship. We have the type of citizens who are willing to auction legacy, liberty, and everything that matters for the sake of the tribe and for the sake of momentary satisfaction. We have a leadership which is so devoid of ideas that's willing to auction whole countries 
to external actors for the sake of driving the latest car and drinking the latest amount. But we have come to the sad moment where we realize that global racism in how you save human life does not care about the car you drive. And so there's something that now joins our destinies together between the African thieves, looters, oppressors, dictators, autocrats, Africa's poor, Africa's middle class, is all of us find ourselves threatened by a preventable challenge. And that threat can be countered by a leadership that looks at not only issues, but that values diversity and inclusion. We are dysfunctional not only because of external factors, we are dysfunctional because we exclude young people, we exclude women, we exclude people from those faiths or ethnic groups that we don't think are valuable enough. And yet we are so ready to, to include outsiders in couching and fashioning the things that we need for survival. So the change for Africa is both a mindset change, a behavioral change, but a focus that says nobody will save us. If we are lizards in Africa, we'll never be crocodiles elsewhere. If Africa is in a mess, it doesn't matter how well educated, how well spoken we are, we are also part of that mess. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this has been a wide ranging conversation, so I'm not even going to attempt to summarize the key points that have come out. I think for me, as somebody who's seated at SOAS, of course, I'm keenly interested in questions around interdisciplinary research and the opportunities that this opens up for uh, broad based, uh, you know, social science and humanities engagement in African universities to respond to the structural issues in the robust and holistic way that we have discussed here today. This is a conversation that has been centered, of course, on leadership and Eva Joyce tells us the answer is feminist leadership. And before you all get your uh, knickers in a knot, she said feminist leadership, not women's leadership. Um, and obviously the key point here uh, as well, the final point is around the space that has been opened up for local philanthropy tapping into diaspora engagement, recognizing that we have a lot of the human and economic resources to be able to rewrite the continent's narrative, how we mobilize that, how we ensure that that is not squandered uh, by um, people in places uh, that are effectively uh, selfish rather than looking towards uh, people-centered engagement is one that civil society, social movements that are currently thinking about responding to the crisis, but also looking forward into the long-term repercussions have to keep in mind. I know that there were questions about what are the things that civil society should do. I doubt that the speakers can offer specific answers because this really is about local contexts and movements and what it is that they want to use as a pivot for the ways in which they shape their action. In addition to, of course, building on much longer histories of social movement engagement. Comrades, Lucia, Seraphine, Brian, EJ, and, and Godwin, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. Asante Nisana, and take care, and thank you all for the participants, and we will have the video up um, somewhere on the internet for those who are not able to watch it. Livestream failed us, so we shall have that video up. Thanks again, and take care.